Greetings, students. Mr. Little here. And in today's History Bite, we're going to look at Chapter 22, Part 3, The Columbian Exchange, aka The Big Trade. So, by the end of this History Bite, you'll be able to answer these two essential questions. How did the Columbian Exchange fundamentally alter the ecology of the planet during this time? And how did the various regions experience both change and continuity as a result of the Columbian Exchange during this time? So what is the Columbian Exchange? It's a term from a book in the 70s called Ecological Imperialism by Alfred Crosby, in which he describes it as the, quote, widespread transfer of plants, animals, culture, human populations, technology, disease, and ideas between the Americas, Africa, and Eurasia in the 15th and the 16th century. So it's a 200 year period uh, and it's the spread of all of these things. Now, you could easily list all of those things uh, and you could get specifics and that's excellent. But when we talk about the Columbian Exchange, it really is a question of who benefited and how you define benefiting as well as the long-term consequences because there, there, were, there are numerous long-term consequences and short-term consequences uh, to this particular uh, exchange. That said, it's not like the Columbian Exchange is without precedent. When various regions have been brought together or connected um, in very rapid succession in the past, we have also seen the widespread transfer of ideas, crops, humans, diseases. Uh, you might be thinking of perhaps the Islamic agricultural revolution, which I touched on in chapter 13. You might also be thinking of the Mongol Empire. Uh, you might also be thinking of things as small or as benign as the Polynesian spread of the sweet potato uh, from South America. So it's not like the Columbian Exchange is unprecedented, but it is on the largest scale we've ever seen in human history because we have two whole sections of the earth coming together. And this exchange was also not one, it was not a, an equal give and take. It was very one-sided. Now, you may have seen this very basic map. Uh, this is a pretty common map where you can see all the things that go to the Americas from Europe, Africa, and Asia, and you can see all the things that come from Africa and Asia and Europe that go to the Americas. So this is a very common map. You see it in a lot of textbooks, but it really gets the idea across that it really was an exchange. Stuff really did go back and forth. So one of the things to keep in mind is that the food exchange, which often gets so talked about, uh, really reshaped the diets of pretty much everyone around the world. The classic thing to think about is, have you eaten something today that is only from one half of the hemisphere, right? Pizza is a great example of something that's from both halves, right? You couldn't have cheese without cows from the, uh, the Eurasia, uh, but you also couldn't have tomato sauce without tomatoes from the Americas. So pizza is the really good example people always go to when you think about how our food comes from other parts of the world. It's also worth noting that a lot of foods uh, that are considered staples or essentials or like basically like the thing that defines a culture in a part of the world has actually come from somewhere else. Rice is a really great example of this. Rice has become a critical staple in most American, and by American, I mean like the Americas uh, diets, uh, but rice came from Asia and the same thing with potatoes. A lot of people see uh, potatoes as quintessentially European or even more specifically quintessentially Irish or Russian or German, right? But potatoes are from South America. So this enrichment of diets and sort of diffusion of good global food uh, did indeed lead to an increase in lifespan, even though, as we'll talk about, there was some serious death that immediately came with the Columbian Exchange. Long term, the spread of foods such as rice, onions, potatoes, tomatoes, and corn, aka maize, uh, really did increase human lifespan on a net, net average. Humans live a lot longer than they used to because of this enriched diet. Now, the other big thing is the spread of peoples as a result of the Columbian Exchange. Now, I said the Columbian Exchange was not a, a two-way thing, and it was a very one-sided thing, and this is true. This wasn't two people meeting together and agreeing to trade things. This was Europeans coming over and making a violent effort to conquer the Americas and doing so successfully in many places. Um, as a result, this led to large human movements, and the most notable one, but not always most talked about one, was the slave trade. In almost every single part of the New World, aka the Americas, slaves made up a majority of the population that was brought over from somewhere else. Europeans made up a very thin slice um, compared to the millions of Africans brought over, uh, 7 million before 1750. And so that's a huge thing. You have this importation of this huge group of people. 
Um, and you do have European migration to the Americas and only in the region of what is now Massachusetts and Maine uh, did you have a place where there was not a predominantly African or Native American population. Um, but there's also sort of ripple effects that led to other movements of people. So for example, with the connection of the Americas to Afro-Eurasia and the spread of American goods across the Pacific to Asia, uh, there was the creation of, of European trading posts in Manila, like I said in the last slide, and this resulted in the movement of large numbers of Chinese to Manila to facilitate the trade between China and the Spanish colony and the Spanish authorities in Manila. And so you could argue that a ripple effect of the Colombian exchange was in fact like the Chinese migration into the rest of Southeast Asia. Right. One of the downsides as well of the Columbian Exchange was the massive loss of life uh, in the Americas. Uh, perhaps, it, although estimates vary and it's, it's hard to put an exact number on it, um, the population of the Americas may have been somewhere up in the 60, 70, possibly 100 million. It's really hard to say. No one really knows, but it was definitely pretty high. And then by 1750, it had dropped down to uh, almost, uh, you know, down to a quarter of that. We're talking down to like 20 million and completely wiped out in some places. So there was a steep drop in population as well as a, a large movement of people. So we think about the Columbian Exchange, we think of food and that's good. We also want to think about the movement of people. It's also important. And here's just a photo of some of the many foods that got moved around. Animals is another really big one we all think about. And so the majority of animals came from Afro-Eurasia and went to the Americas. The one exception would be like the, the llama, which never really took off anywhere outside of South America until the modern day. Um, but a couple of other smaller animals made their way, like guinea pigs became pets, and that was a really popular thing. Um, and while these animals definitely uh, sort of embedded themselves in the ecology of the Americas, so for example, we have feral hogs in the United States, uh, that's a new thing. Uh, we also had horse herds on the Great Plains for many, many years. Uh, for, for a couple centuries after the Spanish arrived in the 1500s, uh, there were there were herds of wild horses, feral horses running around the, what's now the middle of the United States for about 300 years until the United States uh, subjugated the Great Plains. And these new animals changed the lifestyles of some native groups that were still living. So the, probably the greatest example is the, the Plains Indians and the most notable being the Comanche, but we'll talk about them later, uh, who adopted the horse and used the horse uh, to radically change their lifestyle. Some of them were like what we would call um, marginal agriculturalists. They did some, some small scale agriculture uh, and hunted when they could, but buffalo are really hard to hunt without a horse. And so the minute the horse comes along and these Native Americans learn how to domesticate the horse, um, this just radically changes their entire way of life. They, they almost give up farming altogether with a few small exceptions and they completely adopt the horse and they become, you know, a hunting society. Uh, they go from, they go from, uh, you know, transhuman societies, which means they, they stay in one place for the most part, but move in a circle, uh, to arguably semi-nomadic societies where they just move around wherever the buffalo go. So it really did have a radical impact, even in places where Europeans themselves were not very highly directly felt. Um, germs is the last big thing that we want to always talk about. And this one gets a lot of, I, I think is not totally understood clearly. It's usually told as a story of Europeans bring disease, natives die. And there's a lot of truth to that, but it's also, it tends to be an overstated story. And I've found personally doing reading of newer scholarship that, that their estimates, they've revised a lot of the estimates for how many natives actually died um, as a result of plague. And probably the most famous one was the, the number that the population of central Mexico fell from like 20 million down to like 2 million, which is true, but that wasn't caused by a European disease. That wasn't caused by measles, mumps, or smallpox. That was caused by a pre-existing hemorrhagic fever um, called um, uh, cocolitzli. So that wasn't caused by European disease. It is true. There's lots of testament. There's lots of testimony Europeans gave to watching natives die of diseases and natives who testified that their own people were being wiped out by mysterious diseases. But to state, as some textbooks do, that it was up in the range of like 90% uh, is a little egregious and a bit of an exaggeration. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of new and more recent scholarship going around about that. And I would encourage you to look into some of that. Um, there was also the fact that 
germs did not always work for Europeans. So in Africa, but more so in the Americas, uh, diseases definitely kept the lid on some European populations, especially in the Caribbean. Um, yellow fever was known to kill pretty, pretty, pretty grotesquely. Um, and it's believed that yellow fever came over with imported African slaves to the Caribbean. When the Europeans deforested much of the Caribbean islands to build their sugar plantations there because the tropical climate was perfect for growing sugar, um, they removed a lot of the natural uh, water um, water breaks. And so they, they, they ended up creating a lot of these standing pools that had not previously existed with the existence of so many trees. And so this just made it a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. So they disrupted the ecology and created a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes, uh, which then made yellow fever an endemic part of living in the tropics. Most famously is what happened to Napoleon's army that he sent to reconquer Haiti. He sent about 20,000 soldiers and around 16,000 of them died, not of bullets, not of, not of war or, or battle. They died of yellow fever. It was um, pretty brutal. So germs go one way, but they don't just act one way. Uh, germs act in multiple ways. So you should be able to answer those two essential questions from the beginning of this history bite. I want to thank you for joining me. My name is Mr. Little, and I'll see you next time.